Hello, and welcome back to Introduction to Psychology. And uh, today, we will be talking about research and statistics in psychology. I forgot to sound test before I started, so I hope folks on Zoom will let me know if you can't hear anything. So I'll start with a, a question. Does astrology, which is a, a discipline by which people try to understand the world, does it have theories? I see, I see a yes, does have theories. What's an example of a theory in, in astrology? Yes. Like the, if you're a certain type, you have some personality thing, I think. Yeah, so there is a type theory of personality and it says, well, there are these, these 12 patterns in, in the heavens, they're constellations of stars. And, and this group of stars could, could look like um, a, a set of scales. We'll call that Libra. And if you were born under that, constellation, then you have one of 12 personality types. That's a very old personality theory or type theory of personality. And uh, maybe because uh, these stars could look like scales, you care about justice if you're a So that, that is a, a theory. And, and then theories would make predictions. So is, is astrology considered a science? I see shaking, head shaking, no. Why not? Yeah. I don't think there's a lot of like, actual facts to back it up because, that, like, as far as I know, as much as I know and I don't know a lot about it, um, I've never seen like, any like studies done that are proving that there is some connection with, uh, You can't ever prove a theory. You can only disprove them. Okay. But let's say we might, how could we, what kind of study could be designed that, that could test this this personality theory? I don't know, take a bunch of people who are born under the same sign and then test, like ask them a series of questions, see how they line up. And, and see if they act in the way a Libra is supposed to act. Do they endorse higher values of justice on a survey? Yeah. Compared to say, I don't know, who's an unjust sign? Scorpio, Leo, I don't know. I am Scorpio. Okay. So Did you feel like it accurately re represents you? Um, no. One time my friend was trying to guess my sign and she guessed everything but Scorpio. Right. And then asked me, well, what are you? And I said, I'm a Scorpio. And she said, no, you can't be a Scorpio. I like you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really? She said. But I see your point there, because if this is a good theory and if these different personality types actually if this theory works out well then i should be able to from your behavior say well that's obviously a scorpio or i'm, I'm a virgo um so here is uh my, my horoscope for today and uh what does it say today you might spend a lot of time on the phone with friends some of them seniors your conversations will be loving informative and revealing Virgo. As a result, you might decide to attend some group events in your community. A letter, check, or delivery that had been delayed might finally arrive. This is going to release a lot of tension, as you may have feared that it had been lost. Is this a good prediction? It is a prediction. Yes. It's very vague. It is. Give me an example of, of why it's vague. No, it's, it's a whole lot of, this might happen, or you might do this. Yeah, it might, or it might not. So and they cover all their bases. It's, 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 it's essentially saying, it's saying, it's using a lot of words to say nothing at all, essentially. Well, I'm getting from it. Yeah, because it, it might happen, or it might not happen. So today, I might spend a lot of time on the phone with friends, but, but I might not. So it works either way. And when it says your conversations will be loving, informative, and revealing, for that statement to be true, do all three parts have to be true? Or could I just have a, an informative conversation? 
In fact, I hope that any conversation that I have is like informative and revealing. Otherwise, like why have the communication at all? It's kind of the point of a conversation. Um, but if I had a conversation that was kind of not very loving, is it still right if it was informative or revealing? See, so we can kind of play mind games with it. And if we want it to be true, but well, even this, my, my confirmation biases could, could come into play. And I kind of grab hold of, of the ones that, um, that make sense to me. And, and another thing I might, if I'm thinking really critically, really skeptically is, well, how does this follow from the last sentence, right? Are these all my conversations that I have all day long, or do they have to be about the ones that are on the phone, possibly with seniors? That says, as a result, I think there's a connection there, right? As a result of the conversations, which may or may not have been on the phone, you might or might not decide to attend some group events in your community. Is this a group event in my community? I definitely decided to come to class today. And I was thinking about canceling it. I was home with a sick kid, but here I am. I decided to attend this group. See, like, but we can make a, when there's no operational definition, like a lot of things could be a group event as long as there's another person and any other person is kind of part of my community. Now, this one I hope is true because I use a great journal called the Happiness Planner that has a really terrible customer, what, anyway, the way that business is run. I still haven't gotten my planner and it's like, what, the, the 19th? So I'm really hoping that I get my planner today. And if this turns out to be truly very happy. But so it, it predicts that uh, I should be getting a letter, a check or delivery that had been delayed and it might finally arrive or it might not. And it makes sense. It kind of follows naturally that if I received the delivery, if I finally got my planner, that would really relieve my tension because like, I don't have a to-do list. I'm writing on the scraps of paper. But like I may or, or may not have feared that it's been lost. I think the company's just in caution. But yes. Uh, something funny about horoscopes is that uh, I don't believe in them. Yeah. But every time I read someone else's horoscope, it's like, that's me, that's my day. Because really? I do the one I'm guessing. I'm a Scorpio too. So did so this like, work for you? This worked for me. Really? Yes. What happened? Uh, I have problems with my car, and it arrived yet uh, today. Okay. Uh, well, I had a long conversation with my boyfriend. We're in a long distance relationship. We finally fixed a lot of things. Um, I want to be volunteer there we have in here. So this totally landed for you. Yes. Okay. Oh, are you not a Virgo though? I'm not. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, maybe the theory is true and, and this um, astrologist is just an incompetent astrologist. Sure. And then they're mixing up the, the horoscopes. I, maybe this should have been yours. Okay. So, but as you guys pointed out, um, it, it's not working well as a scientific theory because we need to generate hypotheses. We need to make predictions that are really specific. We use something called an operational definition so we know exactly what we're talking about when we say something. Otherwise, something can kind of mean anything, especially if you define it so broadly that you can drive a bus through it. Okay, so today we'll be covering modules two and three on research and statistics. It's pretty, I think the research methods is, is pretty intuitive and the statistics is very basic. So psychology is a science. It's a soft science because social context matters a lot. But it's a science because we use the scientific method. So if a science is not a body of knowledge. Psychology as a discipline has a body of knowledge. But being a science means you are doing the scientific method on stuff. You could um, uh, look at astrology and, and test all of its predictions scientifically. And then you'd be doing science with astrology. And that's a process for asking questions and systematically observing the answers and trying to be really objective and accountable and, and transparent. So we start with some theory, right? A, a theory is an idea that explains the world. You know, there's all kinds of people with all kinds of personalities. Maybe there's 12 types of them and they correspond to these constellations. That's a theory. And, and we're trying to simplify things because we live in a world of, of massive complexity. So a theory can never explain everything. Otherwise, it'd be pointless. 
right? It would it would just be the the overwhelmingness of, of all of reality. So theories try to simplify things and, and give us some heuristics sometimes. Now let's say that that I have a theory, and I believe that more conscientious students will perform better in the class. Does anyone know what conscientious means? It's a big word in personality theory and psychology. Gets at ideas like, like a work ethic and, and diligence and, and being organized, making a plan and sticking to it kind of thing. We'll talk more about that when, when we talk about personality theory. But so I'll predict that these more conscientious students will have better class performance. But now I have to be really clear about what I mean. Like, what does conscientious mean? Like, what if there, there are different personality models out there? And, and what if the five factor model of personality defined that different from the six factor model of personality? I need to be clear about which model I'm using. And then when I go give you guys the personality test, you know, I should use the one from, from the six model, the six factor hexaco model, and not the big fives. I'm not some. You know, unvalidated measure that I just made up. So I have to define what I mean and then have a good measure for it too. Now, what do I mean by class performance? I think that could mean a lot of things. How much you actually learned, how much of that you'll go on to apply in your life usefully, the, the impact that will have on others, well, that's kind of a lot, and it would be really hard for me to assess, but the quick and dirty thing, the, the easiest thing for me to measure is your grade. But the, the quizzes I come up with are not perfect assessments of your knowledge, right? And in 30 questions, I can't capture everything you've read and everything you've learned and all the connections you made, but that will just kind of have to be good enough. Now then, I would have to go and, and actually look at the data. So we'll have a data set that has your, your conscientiousness score according to this personality test. And then I'll have, say, your, your quiz grade or, or your final grade. And I have to see if there's a connection. I might use a mathematical method or statistical method called, called a correlation. So see, how, see if there's a, an association between those two, two variables. And maybe there was and, and maybe there wasn't. So in reality, so your, your greater score on the personality test or on the quiz could reflect a lot of other things than your personality or how much you know. Right? Maybe um, you were drunk when you took your test. Maybe you had a bad week. Maybe you weren't paying attention when you filled in the questionnaire. Maybe you interpreted the questions in a valid way that was totally different than what I had in my head when I wrote the question or when the author of the survey wrote that question. So I need to be aware of all of that when, when, I, when I make claims based on my study. And let's say I do find a connection. Say I even find a strong connection. Well, then I can't just go and say that this is like a, a universal law of human behavior because maybe the students in this class are not representative of all the learners in the world, okay? Right? Maybe my results are only specific to this context or ones that are very similar to this context. Post classrooms in, in post secondary institutions in, in North America. Or, or, okay? My claim or my idea that more conscientious students get higher grades <laughs> would be bolstered by replication. If other people in other classrooms did the same kind of test and, and, and found the same kind of results. Because you can get a result that you know, represents chance. Like there, there are random forces in the world. And sometimes you get results that are flukes. And flukes tend not to replicate. We as humans and psychologists are humans have cognitive biases that uh, affect the way that we think and perceive things. And psychologists are subject to them. And we know this, and we're still subject to them. You, you will find this in the textbook even. The textbook that explained cognitive biases to you, as you read it, you'll notice the authors engaging in that. And it's good to be aware of that, right? It's, if we want to be good scientists, we always need to be aware of that. 
especially in psychology where, you know, unlike say physics or chemistry, things are way more kind of social political. So it's even more important in this science that we're aware of our biases and of our positionality. And, and this is why critical thinking is so important. So what are these biases? There's more than, than are on this slide, but a big one is that we have a natural tendency to see patterns. We have brains that perceive connections and we'll make them up even if they're not there. So you can look at something pretty random like tea leaves left on the bottom of your cup and see something in it. Oh, it's a picture of a, a knife and it means trouble is coming for you. Well, it's just the way the tea leaves landed, okay? We look at clouds. There's a part of our brain called the fusiform gyrus that is specialized to detect faces because we're social animals and we communicate with our faces and we look at other people's faces when they're talking to us. And so there's a part of our brain that's focused on seeing faces, perceiving faces, interpreting faces. And so when you look at some kind of random pattern, if you look at clouds, if you look at the bark of a tree, if there's anything face-like, you're gonna be onto that, okay? You have a natural bias, tendency, proclivity to do that. And, and you'll see pat, find patterns, say, in, in numbers or, or even in the events of your life. You'll be like, well, well, this happened, and then that happened, and this other thing happened, and, and it's all it's all connected, and it's, it's destiny. I'm sure you've done that. I do that. It's a very human thing to do. We tend to be overconfident in our beliefs. Most of us think that our memories are like a snapshot taken by a camera or, or a video recorded by a video camera. It's not really like that. Once you have a memory and you pull it up and you think about it again, it's like you edit the file and then you resave it. And when you pull it up again, well, maybe somebody said something, you think about some other event, you start mixing them up and then you resave it. And that's like your memory. But see how like constructed memories are. We have a bias towards believing that, that we're right and that our, our perceptions are accurate. And so we also believe that other people's perceptions are accurate. And a big issue is eyewitness testimony. In the courts, when there's an eyewitness and they say, yes, I saw this, juries believe that that person is like a, a video camera. And what they're saying was what really happened. But they can be subject to false memories, even if they're acting in good faith. What they think they remember might not be what they really saw. And then there's all kinds of biases that, that get in there, right? Like you might, if, if the person they were watching was a black man, right? Is it gonna be the same as if it was a pretty white girl who did something? It's not the same, okay? Because all these social and cultural biases creep in. So we tend to be overconfident in our beliefs and often in our abilities. Sometimes we think that we can handle things and it might be a little bit beyond our abilities. Something that's really common for me to see as an instructor is students who think that they're gonna take five courses and have like a part-time or a full-time job and have an amazing social life and their first girlfriend or boyfriend and be on like three different societies and also work out at the gym and Okay, that, that, that's overconfidence again. So most folks, let's say you want to focus on something like having an amazing social life, be a C student, nothing wrong with that. But, but it would be very difficult to actually juggle all of those things and um, perform very highly on, on all of them. What else? So we want, sometimes we want to believe something. Like let's say that, you know, you love astrology and you're really into it and your friends are into it. Well, you might have a bias to notice how that horoscope works for you. Our brains are actually more tuned towards detecting events than non-events. So something you might have had happen to you is that you're thinking about a friend and you get like a text or an email from that friend and you're like, wow, it's telepathy. Because you really notice that connection. Like, wow. But what you don't notice is all the times you've thought of a friend and nothing has happened. And you'd need to sort of compare the base rates of those events. 
because there's a non-zero probability that when you think of a friend, they might reach out and contact you because they have like a base rate of reaching out to you. And you have a base rate of thinking about them. And sometimes those things come in touch. But we're like to grab onto that and be like, make more of it than, than there is. Um, it, sometimes we, we have um, personal or sort of political reasons for wanting to believe something. And then we might be super, super skeptical of any disconfirming evidence, but really latch on to the things that seem to confirm our beliefs. My mom's into a lot of these, like, I don't know, conspiracy theories. And, and, and what was she saying the other day? She was like, the research proves that people who get the vaccine get sicker. And I was thinking, like, you didn't read any research. Right? But she wouldn't, she wouldn't want to read anything else. She was like, no. Right? And then we tend to associate with people who agree with us. And they reinforce our beliefs. And this is how people can kind of get radicalized in groups. It's called an echo chamber. And then it's really easy to see connections like in retrospect. So at the end of my day, I can figure out how that horoscope really worked pretty well. A much better test is prediction, right? See if you can accurately predict the future. It's a lot easier to explain the past. You can do that like 10 different ways. Psychologists conduct research in order to answer questions. And a really basic question is, is what happens? There's some phenomenon, let's describe it. And the corresponding research method is called descriptive research. You watch this phenomenon, how much does it happen? Describe the stages. And so descriptive research is about measuring something in order to describe it. And we can do that through what's called naturalistic observation, which is just watching and recording what you see. So let's say you want to study affection in school children. So you sit in the playground and count the number of times that they hug each other. <laughs> that kind of study is really expensive and time consuming. Imagine, you know, you'd have to be out there in the playground watching all recess long for like one hug instance. And then you might be looking the other way. So you have to have a research assistant that's also doing that. So maybe you have two or three people on that job. We have the costs of that could add up really quickly. People will also act differently if, um, if they know that you're watching. So imagine if I wanted to study nose picking. I'm gonna watch you all and count the frequency of, of nose picking behaviors. And if you knew I was watching, you might do that less than you normally would. And that would bias my results. So a quicker and easier way is to use a survey. So I could just ask you, how often do you pick your nose? every day. And that's a lot less expensive because I can hand out a hundred of those surveys really quickly. And, and they can ask about private behaviors. But people might, you might not be honest. You might be like, never, definitely not. Okay. Another thing I could do is a, a case study, like an, an in-depth interview. And we, psychologists do a lot of case studies with people who have, um, you know, really interesting and really rare conditions. And maybe we can learn something from them about how the brain works. So particularly people who have some kind of brain damage. And what function do they still have? What function have they lost? What does that mean about the part of the brain that got damaged? So and you can ask like really, really in-depth questions. So you can get a lot of rich qualitative data. When do you pick your nose? Why? Do you like it? What do you do with it? But answers to that can be biased too, right? People can lie or distort information. They can exaggerate in an interview, which they might do if they're sort of getting attention. <laughs> and the results of case studies might not generalize well, because maybe there's something very special about that single individual, and maybe in, they're not representative of general humanity. So Freud came up with principles of human psychology based on introspection. Okay? So he was the one doing the introspection on himself. And he knew that he had, as a child, he had these strong feelings for his mother and jealousy and hatred of his father. And, and then he realized this is a normal universal stage that all little boys have to go through. 
And if there's some behavior problem, it could be because he didn't work out that mom thing. And he based that on, on a case study of himself by himself. But let's say we're like, okay, interesting idea. Let's do some more research and say we interviewed a, a larger representative sample of men. And if they all said that, like, yes, I struggled with that all my life, there might be something to it. But that one didn't really pan out. Another sort of basic research question is, is when does something happen? What else is this associated with? Right? Maybe you pick your nose when you're alone. So if that were true, we'd expect that as number of people around you increases, frequency of nose picking decreases. So psychologists use correlational research to see if two variables are associated. Right? Do they happen together? Do they vary together? Do they co-vary? Do the variables relate to each other? Do they co-relate? Get it? So the scatter plot there shows the correlation between grade point average and sleep. And what is that? What is that suggesting to you? More the number of sleep, more the number of hours of sleep, more the GP. Yes, yes, and it's within a certain range. So that you've described a linear relationship. So oops, the the more hours of sorry, more hours of sleep, but the higher the, the grade point average. But this is is restricted to the range that's that's been tested. So this goes up to 8.5 hours of sleep. Now what if maybe through some mean sleeping pills, you got people in the lab to sleep for 10 hours, 11 hours, 12 hours, maybe give them a sleeping pill and get them to sleep for 16 hours. Well, that's not going to work so well anymore, right? You might, that linear relationship might change, it might become like a U-shaped relationship. If you have a U-shaped relationship, it will come up on a correlation as a correlation of zero because correlations like this assume a linear relationship and not all relationships between variables are linear. And a famous example of a nonlinear relationship is your amount of arousal in your performance. And say it's performance in, in sports or performance on a test. Well, you perform best when you're a little bit stressed. So you have to care enough and kind of be ready, right? If you're just like super relaxed, don't really care, might not do so well. If you're super wound up and, and you're so stressed you can't think, well, then you'll have lower performance too. So you get another U-shaped relationship. Here's another scatter plot from your textbook. And each point here represents people's average rating of how scary or disgusting a particular animal is. So cats are about 1.25 out of five on scariness. Here's cats, 1.25-ish, which is not very scary. And they have like a 1.2 out of 5 on disgustingness, which is pretty cute. Spiders have the highest average scariness rating. Where's my spider? Okay, very scary. Also pretty disgusting. Okay, and lice have the highest disgustingness rating. And they're also quite as scary as spiders, but, but they're up there. And sort of seeing a connection between scary and disgusting. Bold, pretty scary, not very disgusting. So the bull there is an example of an outlier because it's falling far away from the line. Okay, there's something a little bit different about bulls. Snails. Yeah, they're pretty close to the line. Okay, so this, this is called a regression line. It's the imaginary line that you put between these points. And, and that relationship can be stronger or weaker. Um, this is a, a really strong linear relationship, okay? Like there are all the points are falling close to the line. And most variables that we correlate in psychology are nowhere near that strong, right? These are, this is like a 0.9 correlation. Um, you're more likely to see correlations of 0.3 that are way, way weaker. So that's a positive correlation. As score on the x-axis goes up, score on the y-axis tends to go up. 
A negative correlation is an inverse relationship. As the score on the x-axis goes up, the score on the y-axis goes down. Please do not confuse the direction of a correlation with the strength of a correlation. You can have a very strong negative correlation. You can have a correlation of minus 0.9. That's a lot stronger than a correlation, a positive correlation of, of 0.2. Okay. Strength of correlation and direction of correlation are different. No correlation on a scatter plot just looks like a cloud. But when you run the math to determine a correlation coefficient, nonlinear relationships will come up with zero correlation. That's why you always have to look at the data. You don't just trust the numbers unless you're really, really good at stats and you can see where the numbers are off. Always look at the data. So this is a, a U-shaped relationship, kind of like you might see for uh, arousal and performance. Your performance is best when you're moderately aroused, but it's worse when you're too relaxed or too tense. And then that would be an, an inverted U-shape. I can't think of, of what that might be. Correlation is different from causation. Two variables can be connected haphazardly. There's, there's a website that describes really weird correlations that, that are just sort of spurious. Um, and, and sometimes it can be, you, you don't, if there's a correlation between X and Y, and let's say 0. 0.7, the correlation between X and Y is 0. 0.7, and the correlation between Y and X is 0. 0.7. But you don't know which direction, if there was a causal relationship between them, that association doesn't tell you the direction of the causality. So there is a correlation uh, between ice cream sales and, and violence. The more ice cream we sell, the more violent incidents there are. It's true. What do you think might be going on? Yes. The heat, potentially? It is. Yes. Yeah, so that, that's a third variable problem. So variable C, heat, is driving up both A and, and B, and that makes them look connected. So when it's hot, people buy more ice cream, and heat does increase aggression. Right? When you're cold, you don't feel like doing so much, and you want to stay home and watch Netflix and stay out of trouble. So if we want to determine if one thing causes another, if an antidepressant causes an improvement in depression scores, then we need to do an experiment, right? We want to predict the future. We're going to do that with a hypothesis. We can hypothesize that people who take the antidepressant will have lower scores on a depression test than people who don't take it. And so we want to do that in a really very controlled setting. And it's impossible to get perfect control, but to the greatest extent possible, we want to keep everything the same, everything else the same between these two groups of participants, the ones who took the antidepressant and those who didn't, so that if there's a change in their scores, if the scores are different at the end of the study, we can attribute that to the fact that they did or didn't take the medication. And not to some other thing, like uh, people in one group had more uh, social time with their friends. Okay, so we want to keep, ideally, keep everything the same except for the variable you're manipulating. Really hard to do that with humans, and that's one reason why we do a lot of animal research. So in a, in a descriptive or correlational study, we're measuring what's out there, what's connected to what, but we're not trying to manipulate anything. Okay, but in an experiment, we're actually going to manipulate one of the variables. That would be like the, the dose of the drug, zero milligrams or 100 milligrams, okay? We're actually pulling some string somewhere. So it's called the predictor variable or it's called um, the independent variable. And then what's changing, once you pull that string, say the depression score, 
think it's going to go up and down depending on the dose of the drug. That's called the dependent variable because its score depends on the one that you're manipulating. Okay. So if I do an experiment to test whether getting more sleep results in better grades, like I, as the experimenter, would bring you into my lab where you would sleep, and I might only allow you to sleep for three hours, right? But I wake you up after three hours, or after four hours, or after five hours. I might allow you to get a full night of sleep, and wake you up nat and you'll wake up naturally. Or maybe I'll give you sleeping pills to make you, you sleep more. But I'm doing something in an experiment. And I want to see whether what I'm doing results in a change in the dependent variable, like your grades. So it's, it's very important to keep all the other potential confounding factors as constant as possible. So we want to isolate the, the effect, the, the difference in, say, grades or depression scores to whatever I did, right, to the sleeping. Okay. So I'd make all the participants sleep in the lab because I want to know that the data is logged accurately, right? That everyone's sleeping on the same kind of mattress and it's not because there's a pee under someone's mattress uh, or that a cat sits on your face in the morning. Oh, in a medication study, so you want to assess the effect of antidepressants on mood, right? you'd compare mood in people who took the antidepressant to those that didn't take one, right? They didn't get an antidepressant. But there could be other differences. What would happen if I had two groups and in one group you're on the antidepressant and in the other group you just get nothing? People in the pill group, they're getting the medication, but is there anything else that's happening besides the fact that there's, right, that, that this substance is being delivered to their bodies or that the substance is in them? Like aware of what yeah, and they have a little habit, like right? they have a little blue pill that they can believe in, right? And they're taking that, and they're they're taking it at a certain time of day, and and they're being treated by a, a professional, and that could make them feel a lot better. They feel like they're doing something, they're taking some action, and and somebody cares about them and is trying to do something for them. Eighty percent of the effects of antidepressants are due to a placebo effect. Placebos, you might know these as sugar pills. I don't like to call it a sugar pill because sugar is like a chemical and it might do something, especially if someone has diabetes. So it should be like an inert pill. It looks the same as the blue antidepressant pill and you take it at the same time, but there's no antidepressant in it. Okay? Maybe it's like empty or something like that. It has some inert substance in it. There's interesting research on placebos. Uh, placebos work better at higher doses. So if you have the placebo group, you could be like, mm, what do you want? Two milligrams versus 20 milligrams. You're in the 200 milligram group. Well, those ones see the biggest effect. Placebos work better when they are injected rather than swallowed, because that way the placebo gets right to your bloodstream. But placebos work on certain issues and, and, not, and not so much on others. So let's say you had a type one diabetic and instead of giving them insulin, you gave them a placebo, like saline. Doesn't matter how much they believe in it or how much that jab hurts, it's not going to work. Okay. Placebos work the best on depression and on chronic pain because those things are highly subject to expectancy and to interpretation. Okay. You can sort of have pain and, and not mind it. Like there's some. I don't know, some Buddhist monks who do these crazy things where they cause themselves a lot of pain and they're just like, don't, don't seem to care. And there was one, it was in the 1960s, it was a protest, I think. It might not have been the 60s. He, he self-immolated. He set himself on fire. And he just sat there, like, totally chill. And, and same with, like, sadness and suffering. You don't have to problematize that as bad and, and intolerable. You can just be like, okay, I'm sad. So there's some issues that are actually way easier for us to cope with psychologically, or just are more, we're more able to than something like, um, you know, you have scurvy or, or not enough insulin. That would not, placebos wouldn't work so well. I think it might give you some hope and prove things a little bit for you. There has been neuroscientific research on placebos and what they seem to do is affect the dopamine system. They make you feel hopeful. Anything that happens in your brain 
has some biological basis somewhere. So feeling hope engages the dopaminergic system. And you know, that can lead to some other changes. So there is some, there's a, a chemical basis there. Now, I'll do a better study if I'm doing this antidepressant study. If I have um, one of the groups on the, it's a placebo group, it's a control group, and you shouldn't tell them that they're on placebo. And it won't work anymore. So they don't know. We'll call that single blind. But I'm still missing something. Still, this is, the study is still open to bias. Still doing something wrong. Yes. So the person delivering the placebo and the active pull knows which is which. Yes. Basically. Yeah. And that can affect delivery yeah. of content to someone and they can infer from that possibly. Because I, the psychologist, am subject to all these biases. And one of them is confirmation bias. And what if I helped come up with this uh, antidepressant and it's going to be a breakthrough in my career and all my colleagues will love me and I'll be the keynote speaker at the conferences and I'll get a promotion? When I see those, those patients come in, you know, I might want to think that the ones that I know are in the treatment group are, oh yeah, he seems like he's doing so much better. Seems so much more hopeful, oh yeah, right? And I might treat them differently. I might be like, oh, hi, Joe, nice to see you. And then that might perk them up. So the best studies like that are double blind. So I, the experimenter, wouldn't know which group Joe is in. I would have research staff who knew, but they'd be keeping this secret from me and I'd find out at the end. That's how randomized control studies are done. And studies like that really protect people because there is a lot of interests, right? Economic interests in, in drugs and therapies. Like, so there's a market for them. And, and anyone who's kind of selling a product wants to say, this is scientifically proven to work. And there's a lot of ways that you can get the result you want if you create a study that is open to you know, six different kinds of bias. So now, let's say I'm doing this study, maybe it's an antidepressant study, or maybe it's a study on a certain kind of therapy. There are like over 600 kinds of therapy and most of them have never been tested. How should I put the people into groups? So I start with 100 people, and I want two groups of 50. How do I put them in the groups? What should I do? Yes. Try and randomize it. Like, yes. Put, the coin, put it out of your hand. Random assignment. That is right. It, it would be kind of a, a bit foolhardy for me to say, okay, I'm going to put the most depressed people in the control group and the least depressed people in the treatment group, because then it would come up looking like treatment group was better at the end. Um, with random assignment, you, you don't know for sure that the groups will end, end up equal, right? You can, I could randomize you guys, all hundred of you, into two different groups of 50, and I won't have like the same proportion of men and women in each group or the, the same average age. There'll be little differences, but it's the best thing that we can do. And it's the best way that I can kind of control for things that I, I wouldn't be looking for. You know, I might know that age could be an issue. I might know that gender could be an issue, but there's all kinds of other ways, like a million different ways you could differ that I haven't even thought about. And random assignment um, keeps that down as a source of variance. Right? It doesn't guarantee that everyone's the same at baseline, but it's the best method that we have. Anything else you could do would definitely be worse. And how do you know that uh, which person is less, less depressed and which person is more? Like, so you more give them a, um, there, there are scales for this. So like the, the Hamilton depression inventory is, is one of them. And so somebody who receives a clinical diagnosis of depression would be expected to have a higher score on that scale. And somebody who has no diagnosis would be expected to have a lower score. But you're actually not allowed to make a issue a diagnosis of depression based on a score, just based on a, on a survey. Sorry? Can you also check the serotonin levels? You could, yeah. Uh, but then what are you gonna compare that to? Like. 
what's the normal value of say serotonin and where like we don't have like a standard for that so there's no blood test or or neurotransmitter test for depression there was a theory that depression was caused by low serotonin but it was recently debunked uh, not to say that there isn't a role of neurotransmitters in, in any psychological phenomenon so random is a word that I think has, has lay uses that are not the kind of scientific use of the term. People will use it to say haphazard. Like, oh, that was so random. Like, that was so unexpected. What, what it would mean for me to select one of you at random means that all of you in this class and on Zoom have the same chance of being selected. I'm just as likely to pick you as to pick you or to pick you. And for me to do that, I'd have to use some kind of method. The old school way was write it all down on a piece of paper, put it in a uh, like hat, mix it all up, and then, and then pick one. And, but now we use uh, computers. So I might all give you a code, a number, pick a number at random. Oh, it was number, you know, 50. That's the person that gets picked. But if I don't do that, then I'm way more likely to be subject to some sort of bias. I'm, I'm way more likely to, to pick the person that I can see because you're close to me or somebody whose name I know because you've talked to me or because you've emailed me. And, and those people that sit in the front and talk or connect with me might be different in some way. And that could matter for what I'm studying, which might be, let's say, feedback on, on the course. We keep the whispering down, you can text each other, it's quieter. Um, so this is a metaphor that I, that I use. Um, imagine you have like a pot of soup and, and there's oil on the top and herbs and then all that sort of heavy stuff is, is on the bottom. You need to mix that pot of soup up before you take a spoonful to see what it's like. But let's say that you didn't, and, and all you did was take a little spoonful of oil off the top, you'd have a very different idea of what the soup was like. Because what we do when we take that sample is we make an inference about the population. So I take my little spoon of oil, I'm like, oh, that, I, I can't see the pot. I'm not allowed to see it, but it's just a big pot of oil. So I'm making an inference based on a little sample. So if I want to make the best, the most likely to be accurate inference, I should stir up pot first. And, and that's how I get my, my spoon that is a random sample of the population. There's a, a concept that comes up in your text and it could be thought maybe I'll elaborate it a bit. And that's regression to the mean. You guys comfortable with that concept? <laughs> when something happens, there isn't usually just one cause. Let's say that you, you totally bomb your next quiz, right? You get 30%. Maybe one thing just didn't go wrong for you. Okay? Maybe, I don't know, you missed your bus and the Wi-Fi was down and this and the other thing and your boyfriend broke up with you. And what's the chances that all those bad things are going to happen again? When somebody gets a really low score like that, chances are that even if they don't do anything differently, they won't have such bad luck next week and the score will improve. It'll get closer to the class average. It will regress. It will get pulled back to the mean, to the center of the distribution. And so a big issue in studies of psychological therapies is that they're all done on people who are like at rock bottom. Because when do you go see a psychologist? Right? When your life is falling apart and you can't cope. So when we do what's, what randomized control trials of, of therapies find is that the people in the control group get better too. All these issues that you go see a psychologist for tend to get better on their own. That's regression to the mean because you're looking at people who are just kind of at, at rock bottom because 20 things went wrong for them. And chances are that things will, will get better. Right? You're looking at people who had maybe some, some extra bad luck. Okay, And so that's why you have to have a control group 
And then you look at, say, the, I don't know, the depression scores, and you look for a difference. So yeah, they went up in the control group. Hopefully they went up even higher in the treatment group. But your difference isn't this. Your difference is smaller than you might imagine. So psychologists can't study or, or do whatever they want, however they want, because there are laws and there are ethical codes for the profession that you know, are required to obtain or maintain a license or to do research in a university. I will note that not all people who work in the field of psychology seek registration as a psychologist. Those are overwhelmingly clinical psychologists and school psychologists, but IO psychologists don't, a lot of counselors don't, coaches. But if you wanna do research, academic research in a university, then you have to run it by the, the research ethics board. And the reason they have a research ethics board was because of a guy named Harry Harlow, who studied relationships and the effects of social isolation on social animals like monkeys. And things he did to those monkeys were just like so heart-wrenching that people were like, okay, maybe we need some standards. Um, so we use animal, we do animal research in, in psychology, and it's you know most typically on on rodents, uh, because you can't get that kind of level of experimental control of people. And they might say, no, I'm not doing this study. I'm not interested. But the the animal doesn't really have any choice about participating. Right? And you can separate them and have them in in different cages and where they don't get any other source of stimulation except the uh, variable that that you're manipulating. Okay, so. The costs of doing that research is way lower. The experimental control is way higher. Right? You can do things to animals that you can't do to humans. Um, there are ethical review boards for both research conducted with humans and with animals. But as you might expect, the humans have more rights than the animals. So we uh, rats are a common subject for research on learning and memory. You might hear rats like running mazes or learning mazes. Uh, cats are used for research on vision. Cat eyes and human eyes are very similar, even though they look outwardly quite different. Um, fruit flies for research on genetics. And a concern is how generalizable the, result, the results are. So a cat's eye is similar enough to, to a human eye and visual system to warrant generalizable research results, but you can't do that with a fish. Okay, on to statistics. So there's, there's an example here of, uh, of the authors of your textbook falling into their own biases. So they tell you to watch out for certain things, certain traps, and then they fall into them later. So they tell you that, you know, be skeptical of, of big round numbers. Like, you know, walk 10,000 steps a day, right? They say, use critical thinking, but you're gonna have a module, I can't remember which one, where they tell you that there's a 10,000 hour rule that takes 10,000 hours of practice. Yeah. Sorry? To, to go from, yeah, to, well, to become like an, an, an expert at it. Yeah. And that's the same thing as 10,000, like it's, it's way flimsier than that. If you really look into that study, it's, it's based on some violin students in Berlin and like, what is the thing you're learning? The violin, wait a minute, this, this is not a universal law. They fall into their own traps. So psychologists do that a lot, and I want you to see it happening even in your textbook. They also say that humans can remember 5,000 faces. I went and there, there are uh, what we call in-text citations. So there's a name and a date. You go and look that up on the index. I tracked down that study, and it's not on like 25 students in Scotland. But they, you just sort of see that. Oh, okay, I can remember 5,000 faces. Um, then they also point out uh, sort of how we can be manipulative and how we present graphs, okay? And then they give you this graph. So this graph shows, um, so I think this is, this is the, no, sorry, this is they're trying to explain the problem to you, right? Sorry, I correct myself. So they're, they're giving you this as an example of, of a misleading graph. So what's, what's wrong with this? How are they manipulating you? This is their teaching tool that they give you in that module.
Yes. They have the numbers on the first graph go from 95 to 100 percent, uh -huh. and the second graph from zero. So zero to 100. These are the differences. And then they zoomed in on it there, 95 to 100, and then exaggerates them. And it looks like this truck is really awesome when it's like, eh, maybe, maybe it's not so different. Okay. So they teach you that. Then look what they do in the module on sleep. Okay, so in the module on sleep, you're presented graphs showing the number of car accidents before and after people either gain or lose an hour of sleep. And when you like change the clocks, and it looks like there are a lot more accidents when people lose sleep and a lot less after they gain sleep. I can't hear you. So I went and I took these numbers and I put them in Excel and I replotted them. See, they did it to you. And maybe they're trying to do you good. Maybe they want you to sleep more and have less accidents. Maybe they're trying to help, but they're doing it manipulatively. So watch out for that. But yes, you're right. Okay. So we can look at a set of scores as a distribution. This is the distribution of grades for quiz one. What's it, what's it telling you? How do you like describe that distribution? We, tend, we talk about center and spread. So the middle of the distribution is around, you know, 75-ish, 78-ish. You can pick the highest bin there and say that's the most common score, but it's not that much more common than the others. We could look at it, its range, you know, the difference between the highest score and the lowest score. So center and spread. So I gave you a bunch of, of numbers there. Okay, and let's say I want to give you a measure of, I wanna know how old this group is. What would be kind of the, the most representative measure of center? Something about that group that's throwing things a little off. Yes, so there's a, a 95 year old there. So if I were to use the mean, which is to add up all the numbers, divide by the number of numbers, it'll pull in that 95. But hey, why shouldn't we? Let's be inclusive. But the, you get an average age that's not representative of most people in the sample. And so if you use that mean, you'll have a high standard deviation. Standard deviation is the number of points that people on average fall from the mean. So the less representative the mean is, we've got pulled away by an outlier, the higher the standard deviation will be. So if I take that number out, then I get a much lower standard deviation. But I could look at the range, right? I could take the highest number minus the lowest number. <laughs> um, the median. The median is the middle number once you have arranged all the numbers from lowest to highest in order. Okay, pull the one out of the middle of the distribution once it's ordered. And the median is not sensitive to that outlier of the 95 year old. It could be 200 and it wouldn't change because it's not about those middle numbers. And then the mode is, is the most common number. So most people there are 18. So I could say, looking at the distribution, well, most people in that group are 18. Or I could say, well, the average age is 24. And they're all right. Okay, but they, they say something different. And you could, you have to consider what is the most, um, what is the best measure of center of spread to you. Um, otherwise you can sort of use it manipulatively. And, and what some people do is they'll report the mean income when there's a lot of income inequality. So you have like a bunch of people with low incomes and one billionaire. Oh, the average income looks pretty good. That's not what most people are earning. So it can, it's good to look at it all, right? Look at the mean, look at the median, look at the mode, look at the range and the standard deviation and look at the data set, okay? So those are the, the 
collect the stats for the week one quiz as when I pulled the data yesterday afternoon. Okay, so you can see that the average is 75. The mode is 80. That means that the, that the score that occurred the most was 80. And that could mean it only happened twice and everyone else got some, some other score. But twice is the, the most frequently occurring single value. And the standard deviation is pretty wide at, at 15. That means that whatever your score was on that quiz, okay, now compare that to the average. Let's say the average is 75 and you got a 70. So you your deviation is five. The standard deviation is like the average deviation for the entire class. And it was 15, which is fairly wide. And you can see there's something called negative skew there, which means it's a tail on the low end. It's not quite symmetrical. Um, so a little more on, on distribution. So I want you to imagine, let's do a little thought experiment here. I'm gonna take a ping pong ball, okay? And I'm gonna drop it in here. I'm gonna go down this chute and it's going to strike one of these pegs. And then it can go left, my hand is really shaky, or it can go right. It has a 50% chance of going left and a 50% chance of going right. Okay, so let's say strikes this one and then goes this way, okay? And then it has a 50% chance of going left or right again. Repeat that all the way down. What distribution do you think you're going to get at the bottom? How will they pile up? Do you think there'll be, I don't know, more at the edges, left in the middle? Will it be the same? Will all of them, you know, end up with, say, the same number of ping pong balls in them? What do you think it would look like at the end? So you think there'll be more at the edges and less in the center. Why do you think more would end up on the edges? So like, you think these would be the most popular dims. I just feel like because it's scattering back and forth, it's less what do with the Okay. Yes. What I'm thinking is sort of the opposite of that, that at the very edges would be less likely because there's less space for them to go. There's a, there's You're exactly a, right. It's not a V, it's a... There are fewer pathways. Fewer pathways. So the, the ones that are more likely to be filled are the ones with the most pathways. Yes. So for me to get so the, into this bit over here, well, I have to go right and right and right and right and right and right and right, and right, and right, and right all the way over. And there's only one path to achieve that. And just like to end up in this department, it will have to left and left and all the way down, right? So would this be a double curve sort of? Yes, that's what happens. Um, and so think of, uh, there are many traits in psychology are that are um, random variables. They arise because of some random event, like striking the ball this way, that way, end up with a normal distribution. It's not true for all traits. There's uniform distributions, there's burrito, but this normal distribution is probably one of the most common. And so let's like say something like IQ score, it's normally distributed. So what has to happen to you for you to have a really high IQ score? Um, well, a lot of things have to go right. You have to have uh, parents with high IQ scores. Uh, they should be rich so that you go to the best school and give you an excellent diet and have all the time in the world for you and don't leave you stuck in front of the TV, right? All these things have to go right. And for you to end up in the really low IQ bin, maybe a lot of things have to go wrong for you, right? You, you got the bad genes and you're born into poverty and your parents went to jail and uh, they, nobody, they left you alone all day, right? Kind of like go left all, all the way. But most people, you know, have a combination of things happen to them, right? You, you have good genes, but they dropped you on your head. Uh, you went to a great school, but you got bullied. And so you kind of end up in the middle. And so there are more people who are in the middle of normal distributions. So, so if you think of your grades again, so for you to consistently get really high grades, well, fortune has favored you at many terms over and over and over again. So um, a random variable is, is a variable whose values depend on the outcomes of, of random events. 
but they end up very often with these these normal distributions. And so this is I I hope you've learned this in like grade twelve, right? You're not seeing this for the first time. Oh no. Okay. So in a distribution like this. 68% of people will score within one standard deviation of mean. So average intelligence is 100, 68% of people fall between 85 and 115. 95% of people fall within two standard deviations. And we say that your score is normal. It usually just means that you, your score fell within two standard deviations is when that middle 95%. And then almost everyone, 99.7, fall within three standard deviations, the mean on a normal distribution. But technically, this is a theoretical distribution that's tails go to infinity. So not symmetrical actually has a, a tail on the lower end. But then you could say, all right, well, was your quiz score good? That's a different kind of question than was it normal, right? So the average is 75. So does that mean that it's good if it's at or near or only if it's above the average, if it's within one or two standard deviations? Or, or do you have some kind of a standard? So norming is an act of comparing your individual score to, to the distribution to see where you fall compared to other people, right? Are you at or above average? When I'll, I'll give you a personality test later on, the hexaco, and I'll just tell you if you're above or below average for the group of people that the test was normed on for your scores on, say, extroversion. But does normal mean good? Well, there's a normal range for, for vitamin D. But some people would say that, you know, we're all vitamin D deficient because we spend 95% of our time inside, don't get any sun, and don't supplement vitamin D. So normal or within a normal range doesn't necessarily mean good or, or desirable. Then some tests are criterion based, right? You might arbitrarily decide that only A's are good and your score must be an A. You could decide that. A's are criterion. I use a criterion, right? I want to see everyone earning at least 60%, right? And, and, and I'm happy with that. So for this test, 85% um, of the class met the criterion, got 60 or over. So I'm sort of satisfied with that. Like a course DFW rate of 15% is fine. Okay. So there's different ways of interpreting what, what the score means. When you find a difference, well, is it reliable? If you did that test 10 more times, did you find it again? If someone else somewhere else did that same kind of test, would they find the difference? How big is it? Is it a really big difference, a really small difference? Does it even matter? You have a big difference, it doesn't matter. I mean, there are big differences in your height in this classroom. I don't care. Differences in your academic skills might matter a lot, but they wouldn't matter at a party. So context matters. And then if I find a difference and I go and report this difference to the media, well, what actions will that justify in people who read that story and in people who write policies? So, and there are standards for how big a difference is, and that's called an effect size. Most effects in psychology that we talk about are small or very small. Give you an impression what a very small difference is. So most differences between the genders on some construct are men more this than women would be a very small difference. So that's kind of like the average the difference in the average heights of girls aged 15 and 15 and a half. You might not even be able to see that. But a large difference is like grossly perceptible. That's a difference in the average heights of 10 year old versus 18 year old girls. You can see that. Okay, the difference in average height between men and women is, I believe it's a large difference. But in psychology, you're talking about tiny differences and then making a lot out of them and sometimes stripping them of their social context. Okay, but then, you know, maybe a small difference matters. So let's say that the program reduced bullying from 60 to 55%. And what if, so somebody didn't commit suicide because of that? Well, that made a big difference to them and to their family. So let's say that you establish that a difference exists. Well, what are you going to do about it? Okay, that's British psychologist Francis Galton. And he discovered that what he called intelligence, and we could have a philosophical debate about what intelligence means, but it has a strong hereditary component, right? How your cognitive ability probably looks a lot like your parents. And, and he found that there are, there are group differences in in intelligence. How are we measuring that? Now we have IQ tests. 
But what did he want to do with that story? He was an advocate for eugenics. He thought that those elements of the human population who scored lower on these tests should be put in work camps, kind of like concentration camps. They can do work for the rest of society, but they're not allowed to breed. Right? You're only going to breed the highest um, scoring people, right? Not allowed to have children. He inspired the Nazis. Okay. He inspired the sterilization of people with intellectual disabilities. And he also developed the correlation coefficient with his student, um, Carl Pearson. So that coefficient of when I talk about 0.9, that's the Pearson co uh, correlation coefficient. So psychology has an interesting history. So be careful before you run with conclusions, right? Now, that other guy is Alfred Binet. And he knew that there were also these, these differences in faith skills that, that you could measure. He knew that some students didn't seem to benefit from a classroom education as much as others. So he was doing his research when public education became a thing in France. And let's say you put all the five-year-olds in a classroom, grade primary, some of those students don't get as much out of it as others, okay? And he developed the first intelligence test, it was better than the ones that Galton was using, it was kind of the first official intelligence test. And he did that in order to identify the students who would benefit from extra support. So you, let's identify the students that can use extra resources. Those are completely different things to do about a difference. Are there any questions or comments? No. Nope. For next class, um, modules 10, 11, and 12 on differences between people, um, I am now going to stop the recording and be available for any informal conversation.